Mitt namn är er Eirik Helland. Jag är er territorial sales manager för Honeywell Safety Products här i Norge. Håller på med alla alla produkter inom för det som går på personlig värnutstyr. Um, i dag så har vi då och det är er väldigt hyggligt att se uppmöte. Uh, hoppas att uh, alla följer när de går härifrån att de har haft något igen för för det här seminariet. Det är er helt säker på. Ehm uh, dagens man är er ju då Brad Witt. Uh, som står här bak. Han ska få låta presentera sig själv uh, efterpå. Uh, mitt namn är er nämnt Claes Haglund vid min sida min gode kollega som då är er produktchef för för det här som går på intelligent hearing alltså på Quiet Pro produkterna. så har vi också någon gästeuppträdande av Roar Höydal. Hej Roar. Vi har snackat samman men inte möttes. Hyggligt. Den tar vi med en gång. Erik, hej. och så har vi också Marit Uppsanger fra från Linjebygg. Där är er Marit. Hej hej som ska då få låt och snacka lite om sina erfarenheter om runt det här uh, temat. My name is Brad Witt. That is Witt, not Pitt. <laughs> I was almost famous, <laughs> just one letter away. Uh, my apologies for the funny accent that I have. I do come from San Diego in the U.S. and uh, here for a few days in Norway. Thank you very much for joining us today. We know you have other things to do. The emails do not stop. The phone calls do not stop. But still, I'm, we're glad that you take time to come and visit with us today about uh, hearing protection, hearing conservation. Uh, I met a few of you before we started, and there's actually quite a, a variety of experience here in the room. Some of you have been dealing with noise issues for quite some time, many years. Others of you, this is a fairly new topic. What I would like to do is, uh, for just the first five minutes or so, uh, maybe ten minutes, cover some very basic material about noise and hearing protection. And then within uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll uh, talk more about our main main topic today, about uh, actually stopping hearing loss in the workplace. My background is that I'm an audiologist. Uh, I don't know what the Norwegian equivalent is, uh, but an audiologist, most of them are, are dealing with children who have ear infections or adults who wear hearing aids. All of my working life has just been out in industry with noise. I was an uh, audiologist for Saudi Aramco for about six years in Saudi, and then for the past eight years with Howard Light Hearing Protection here. So uh, I've worked quite a bit in oil and gas and understand some of the challenges that are uh, with uh, hearing, hearing protection in, in the industry. I want to begin with some very basic information. My apologies, we cannot turn out down the lights because of our filming today. Uh, but just a reminder, today I'll, sp- I'll speak a lot about uh, hearing protection on the job. Uh, but just a reminder that we have just as much uh, hearing loss and hearing uh, noise damage off the job too. You'll have many workers who come and to work and they're around work each day. They go home and they love to turn up their music loud or work with their power tools or uh, other noisy hobbies, motorsports or something. Uh, so anything that we say about hearing protection on the job certainly applies off the job too. I mentioned that just because at the beginning, it's very important that we realize many times who often pays for that hearing loss that is incurred off the job, many times it's the employer uh, because a compensation claim maybe is filed and there's not or has not been a good way in the past to distinguish off the job from on the job uh, noise exposures. Also, just some very basic information about that decibel scale. Just a reminder that decibel scale is this logarithmic scale. That's our fancy math term, meaning that uh, every doubling of the noise exposure, it's not linear. Every doubling of the noise exposure is just a, a, a three decibel increase in the decibel scale. So going from 75 to 78 decibels is a doubling of the noise, 78 to 81. So it's very much this type of effect with noise exposure and damage to hearing. So small increases in that decibel level represent enormous increases in the noise level. Uh, We have, let's say, uh, uh, again, a doubling of the noise every three decibels. If we go up 10 decibels in that noise level, that's 10 times more noise and more damage to hearing. If we go up 20 decibels in the noise level, that's 100 times more noise exposure, more, um, more damage to hearing. It works the other way in reverse also. When we have uh, noise that we're trying to eliminate, and we first of all try engineering controls, but engineering controls are certainly very difficult because of this decibel scale. If we have, let's say, 20 motors running in our facility, we have a noise level that's about 95 decibels, and we want to reduce that to a very safe noise level down in the low 80s. 
then uh, let's start by removing half of our machinery and see what our noise level is. If I remove half of my equipment or turn it off, uh, then our noise level only came down three decibels to 92 decibels. Okay, I'll remove another one half of my machines. Uh, my, now I only have five motors running. My noise level only came down to 89. So you can see where we're going with this. It's very difficult to engineer out the noise. I get down to one machine running there. I finally have my noise level that's 83 decibels, but I had to turn off 19 of my 20 machines to do that. So engineer controls are always our first line of defense in stopping hearing loss, to stop noise at the source, but uh, very difficult to engineer out the noise in many cases. We will not spend very much time at all talking about European regulations, but just a quick summary that we define hazardous noise is this balance between intensity and duration. And uh, EU uh, you know, regulations define uh, 85 decibels over eight hours as that permissible exposure limit. If we increase that noise, again, double the noise to 88 decibels, the allowable exposure time gets cut in half to just four hours. Uh, most of you probably have workers on eight or 10 hour work shifts, maybe, excuse me, 10 or 12 hour work shifts. And so because of that longer exposure time, the allowable exposure uh, level is uh, much more conservative, 83 decibels instead of the 85 decibels. So that's the way the exposure limits work. It's this balance between intensity and duration. Just a quick summary of the uh, uh, directive we have uh, in the EU concerning our noise levels. We have what's defined as that 80 decibel lower, exposure, lower action level. At this point, this is a precautionary level. Uh, we have hearing protectors that must be made available and training programs for the noise exposed workers. Audiometric screening needs to be available for the workers, but then when our noise levels reach 85 decibels, again, averaged over that eight hour time period, we call that the upper action level. Hearing protection is required. Audiometric evaluation needs to be made available to the workers. Some warning signs post posted in the noisy areas. By the way, uh, uh, EU directive also defines an 87 decibel limit to define the exposure limit, uh, maximum allowable noise level in the ear under the hearing protection. Now, when this was defined a few years ago, uh, we did not have a good way to measure that. Uh, but now there's several good methods that we have of actually measuring the exposure level under the hearing protection that we'll talk about a, a bit later. So whether you will actually achieve that, that level that's, uh, I think most of you know, hearing protection comes with uh, labeled ratings on the box, box. I have an old box here from, it's, uh, it says uh, this hearing protector offers 37 decibels of protection uh, when it's used properly, or at least that was measured in the laboratory. Whether you will actually achieve 37 decibels of protection depends on a few things. Number one is your fit. We'll talk about fit in just a few minutes here, which is critical. But also I say wear time. And when I say wear time, what I mean is how many minutes did you cheat throughout the day in using your hearing protection? You're supposed to be using the earplugs, your earmuffs, but you pulled it out for just a few minutes to talk to a coworker or talk on the telephone or hear some sound from your equipment or something like this. The way this works is if you wear a hearing protector for almost all day, but you cheat for just five minutes, that's five minutes cumulative, the other seven hours, 55 minutes, you wore that hearing protector perfectly. You think you're wearing an earplug that's rated for 30 decibels, but really it's only giving you 19 decibels of protection for the entire workday. This is not very intuitive. If you uh, cheat for, for 30 minutes out of your workday, then uh, you think you're wearing an earplug rated 30 decibels for the other seven and a half hours, but because you cheated for just 30 minutes, you're only getting 12 decibels protection. So the moral of the story here is in noise exposures, these small intervals of no protection, they quickly cancel, they quickly void the large intervals of, of good protection. Let me walk through an example of that if I can. So uh, we have uh, Olaf who comes to work each day and he works in 100 decibels of noise. And uh, it's uh, very noisy, but he puts in the, the earplugs and he wears that earplug very well. He puts it in nice and far, that earplug is inserted quite far. That brings the noise level at his eardrum down to 70 decibels, meaning he gets 30 decibels of protection. Let's follow Olaf throughout the day. He wears that earplug just fine. Uh-oh, right after lunch, he pulls that earplug out. And for just five minutes, he's wearing no earplug. He's exposed to 100 decibels of noise. And then he puts it right back in and wears it just fine the rest of the day. So my question for you is, for those five minutes, how much more noise was he exposed to than he was the rest of the day? And you already know the answer to this because we just discussed it a few minutes ago. But remember, three decibels is 
two times the noise. And you can see where we're going. 10 decibels is 10 times more noise. 20 decibels more, 100 times more noise. And 30 decibels more, 1,000 times more noise. This is this logarithm scale that, that is making these large jumps in our noise exposures. So um, the, the important story here is no cheating. If you're supposed to be using your hearing protection, yeah, you use it all the time. And let me pause there on, on those basics just very quickly. I will be uh, hearing from uh, some others in just a few minutes, but I want to see if there's any questions so far on this material. I think that was just a quick groundwork. If not, then we go into a quick fitting lesson. My question here is, uh, I want to introduce this topic with a simple question. Which earplug is, uh, how, uh, excuse me, how much protection are these earplugs offering? I have three photos on the screen. And uh, you can see the first photo, this gentleman has no earplug in his ear, so obviously he's getting zero decibels of protection. This third photo shows a very well-fit earplug. That earplug is in nice and far. He's getting 33 decibels of protection when we measure it. Now my question for you is, what do we do with this middle photo? That earplug is in the ear, but is it offering 30 decibels or zero decibels or something in between? Well, the sad story here is he's getting zero decibels of protection. It's very difficult to tell from that photo, but that ear earplug is just barely in his ear canal, just like, like this. It's uh, uh, not offering much protection at all. Now, if you're a safety manager, that's a problem because you would probably walk around and, and look at your, your, your workers and do an inspection and see this, this worker and, and say, oh, he's fine. He has an earplug in his ear. So this worker number two is very similar to worker number three as far as protection. But actually worker number two is just the same as worker number one, no protection because of the fit of that hearing protector. Uh, we tell people just uh, these simple instructions with the foam earplugs at least to uh, roll down that ear earplug, uh, pull back the ear, open that ear canal up uh, by spreading it open and uh, inserting that nice and far. I want to actually give you a, just a quick demonstration of that word roll down. I have, uh, oh, is there some water that I could, uh, oh, I didn't see that, good. Can, I, can you get a cup of water? Just a glass of water for me. I have here a funnel that's about the same, has an opening about the same size as the ear canal. And what we're going to do is roll down that foam earplug, insert it in the funnel, and just see how well it holds the water. Uh, oh, thank you. I roll it down nice and small. I'll put it in there. I do have to wait just a few seconds for that foam to expand. Let's put that in and see how we do. I better use the other glass too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Let's try this and see how we hold the water. Okay, we'd call that a nice fit. Now, if someone comes along, a worker says, oh, these earplugs, you just squeeze them down. So I will squeeze down that earplug and uh, insert it in the other funnel. Let's wait just a few seconds for that to expand also. So only one more difference, roll it down, or squeeze it down. Let's try that now and see if uh, how we do with the fit. All right. Oops. Hey. Uh oh. <laughs> so we have a problem, don't we? A leaky earplug. And although this one is leaking water, if that's inside the ear, it would just be leaking noise. Now, why? Why did that leak? Any, any guesses? Any? Why did the squeezing it down make such a leaky earplug? When I put it in the ear canal, it just uh, folded over on itself. There was, very, there was a channel, there was a, a crease or a wrinkle, and the noise just leaks through. So one little word difference as far as the fit makes a huge uh, difference as far as the amount of protection uh, that we get. Uh, by the way, if any of you uh, do training like this and want to use the funnel example, I brought some funnels here and you're welcome to take one. And I have an instruction page here about how to do the funnel demonstration if, if you're doing any training like that. It's a good visual, a good example to, to show the workers um, how to get that proper fit. So we often use these kind of training videos that just uh, teach the workers the importance of uh, roll down that foam earplug, nice and small, no creases, no wrinkles. And then everyone has that bend in the ear canal in order to insert the earplug uh, in the ear. If you just try to put it in, it won't go very far. We tell people pull out on the ear. 
uh, nice and, and far in order to spread open that air canal, get it nice and far. Look how far that earplug is in. We say it's touching his eyeballs inside his head. <laughs> uh, one visual cue, if you have that earplug in far enough, is uh, this one, if I roll it down nice and small. Whoops, there we go. And insert that, uh, nice and good. This one I won't roll down, I won't reach over. I'll just put it in my ear, but I will push hard. And immediately you can tell the visual uh, difference, but if I look at you face to face, this earplug you probably cannot see at all, but this one you can probably see hanging out of the ear. If I looked in the mirror, I, when I'm doing fitting instructions, I'll often bring alongside a mirror and show the worker, look, that earplug really is sticking out quite far. Or have your neighbor, you know, look at your coworker to get visual cues as to how the, that earplug is, is uh, how deeply it's inside the ear. In fact, on this next slide, you'll see that our worker, when he, he has that earplug inside his ear, but when he turns to face the camera, that earplug just disappears. And that's a good sign of a good fit if you cannot see that earplug when you're looking uh, nose to nose or face to face of that worker. Does it make a difference as far as the protection? It makes a huge difference. So here, this, uh, this is the way we express results in our laboratory. We have the, the frequency going across this axis, uh, low frequency bass tones here, high frequency treble tones here, and the amount of protection, 10, 20, 30 decibels of protection. Uh, our word for protection is attenuation. Uh, here we have this blue earplug that offers 40 or 50 decibels of protection at most frequencies. And here we have the red earplug that only offers, well, offers no protection down in the low frequencies, but a little bit in the higher frequencies. Now I mention this just because these are not two different earplugs. This is the same earplug on the same worker on the same day, about 10 minutes apart. The first time we told him, Fit that earplug by rolling it down, reaching over your head and putting it in nice and far. And he did that and obtained the blue line results. And then just uh, 10 minutes later, we said, all right, this time take that earplug and just push it in. Don't roll it down, don't reach over your head, just push that earplug in. And he obtained the red line results. Same earplug, same worker, same day, just 10 minutes apart. The only difference was how, how he fit it. Um, so a few myths about that hearing protection that we want to uh, address today. Uh, number one, bigger is not necessarily better when it comes to hearing protection. Some people have the mistaken idea that, that ear muffs block more noise than ear plugs. Generally, if you have a well-fit ear plug that seals the ear canal, you get much, uh, actually, uh, more protection from that uh, ear plug. There's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all ear plug or ear muff. If, uh, you offer, if the only ear plug that you offer your facility is this large foam ear plug, uh, you're almost guaranteed that most women in the facility will not get a good fit. Women, in, women, in fact, uh, Asians and Africans will often have, as a population, uh, typically have a smaller ear canal. And a large ear, ear plug is just not going to uh, fit very well inside that ear canal. It's impossible to predict individual protection from these labeled ratings, even if you derate them. We'll discuss that in just a few minutes here. And an earplug inserted only halfway does not offer just half the protection. Some people, some workers have the mistaken idea that if you uh, put an earplug inside the ear and you then have a difficult time hearing your workers, well, I'll solve that by just pulling it out halfway. And in acoustics, oftentimes it's all or nothing. If you uh, pull it out halfway, sometimes you break the seal and you have no protection then. Let me pause there for just a moment about the fitting of the hearing protection. Any questions on that material? Are we good with that so far? All right, we're going into a little, a little more advanced material here about these rating numbers that you see on the package. Again, in, in Europe, throughout Europe, every hearing protector that's marketed must have that rating number, the, the SNR on the package. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I have nothing against the transportation industry, but just a few reminders that many times we have protective barriers that do not protect very well. This uh, ship uh, overshot its mooring here. Uh, this is not a new problem. This is from a train station back in the 1800s. This locomotive uh, lost its protective barrier somehow. I'm sure this was a... Uh, a, uh, we say a letter in someone's personnel file, whoever the engineer was, that uh, there's a problem here. So protective barriers do not always work. Uh, let me introduce that with a little quiz. We have a work site that had 100 decibels of noise. And let's say we give out the earplugs to the workers, the rating number on that earplug is 25 decibels. And my question for you is how much noise is reaching the eardrum of the worker? You would not be wrong if you maybe did the math and said 100 decibels of noise 
minus 25 decibels of protection means that 75 decibels is actually reaching the eardrum of the worker, a very safe level. You would not be wrong, but I don't think you would really be right either. Uh, so the answer here is we have no idea. We have no clue how much noise is actually reaching the eardrum of the worker. Uh, it all depends on that fit. Maybe he has that leaky earplug as we were demonstrating before. I manage one of the acoustic laboratories that generates these rating numbers. And uh, I'm here to tell you, don't trust those numbers. It's not because we do anything uh, tricky or sneaky with those numbers. Instead, it's a ideal number under laboratory conditions. And whether your workers will actually achieve that number that's on the package depends on the fit and also the wear time uh, that they use. So it's a laboratory estimate of the amount of protection that most workers will receive when it's, when it's properly fit, and that's critical. It's only a population estimate. It's not a predictor of whether you will get 37 decibels or whether you will get 37 or you will get 37. Oh, I just turned this off. The way this works, I will show you exactly how you generate these rating numbers. You bring in 16 human subjects into the laboratory. You test them, first of all, with the earplugs and then without the earplugs. And the difference between those two tests simply tells us how much protection uh, that we're getting. One researcher actually took this out into the field and he uh, tested one over, uh, I think, 192 workers at the steel mill. And he uh, comes into a, a, the a car park of the facility with a trailer that has several hearing test booths. He takes workers off the production line while they're wearing their earplugs and says, don't uh, adjust your earplugs. I want to test the fit of those earplugs. He puts them into the trailer into the hearing test booth, does a special hearing test with those earplugs in. He then has them remove the earplugs and test them again. And here were the results as far as how much protection they received. Each dot on this plot shows one of these 192 workers and how much protection they achieved some 10, 20, 30 decibels of protection. They're all wearing an earplug that's rated for 27 decibels. If they actually achieved 37 decibels, they'd be somewhere around that red line. But uh, you can see some workers achieved higher than that 27 decibels, but you see our problem too. A number of workers achieved much lower, uh, two or three or five decibels of protection. Now, many people might work, uh, look at this plot and say, oh, those, those earplugs just don't work. But this researcher thought he saw a pattern. And let me ask you, do you see a pattern to the way these dots are distributed here on this graph? Don't you almost see maybe two bands? There's a band of workers up here who are pretty close to the rated number on the box. They understand how to fit the earplug. But then there's a band of workers down here who just don't get it. They're getting very low protection. Maybe they just don't know how to fit that hearing protector. And so uh, this researcher gave another two or three minutes uh, of instruction personal instruction to these workers. He says, look, I, you really do have to take that foam earplug and roll it down nice and small. And then reach over your head and open up that ear canal to get it nice and inserted nice and far. When he retests those workers after that two or three minutes of instruction, then suddenly now they're getting 14, 15 decibels of more protection. So they're where they should be as far as their protection levels, but it was just with that personal one-on-one -on -one training. So his uh, conclusion was, uh, nothing beats one-on-one -on -one training, but also it's a problem with our workers, not a problem with our earplugs. Oh, actually, let me go through that. I, uh, again, I, I don't know uh, a Norwegian uh, regulation or guidelines as well as you do, but I was told uh, recently that OLF just credits uh, 12, uh, credits earplugs with just 12 decibels of protection. Is, is that fairly accurate, I think you would know better than, better than I, no matter which style of earplug that you offer, uh, uh, the, the population average would be about 12, 12 decibels. And yes, that is an average perhaps. In fact, if we put that 12 decibels here on this graph of these steel workers, uh, that might be fairly accurate. And yet so many people got better than that 12 decibels and so many people achieved worse than that 12 decibels. So uh, 12 decibels might be a population average, but it's a very poor indicator as to how much protection you will individually be receiving. There is no one here who actually, or maybe a few people here, who actually obtained 12 decibels of protection. In Europe, we have a special problem here in that each jurisdiction has its own derating or uh, corrections to the rating numbers on the package. Let's start with this uh, worker, uh, Peter. Uh, where Peter works is uh, in the uh, works around some kind of uh, machinery. Let's say he's a mechanic in in a uh, in some facility. Uh, when he is in France, 
And Franz derates the hearing protector by eight decibels. So this earplug, even though it's rated for 33 decibels on the package, he only gets 25 decibels of credit for that earplug in France. When he goes to Germany, it's derated 13 decibels. So his protection now, the same earplug, Peter's the same worker, but now he only gets 20 decibels of protection according to the regulation there. Oh, when he goes to Norway, he only get 12, yeah, receives 12 decibels of protection from that same earplug. When he goes over to Sweden, in most situations, Sweden does not derate, so he gets the full 33 decibels of protection. Now, this is the same worker, the same earplug, just different regulations and different guidelines determine how much protection he will receive when he wears that earplug. I want to show you some new tools that we have now where we're not estimating, we're not derating uh, how much protection, we're actually measuring how much protection we receive from the hearing protectors. I want to introduce this with this photo. And can anyone tell me what occupation uh, this worker is? What, what does he do for an occupation? He's, he's a miner, someone says. And how, can you, how do you tell? How can you determine he's a miner? Well, he's, he has some gas detection equipment, apparently, but he's holding what? He's holding that bird in the cage, the canary in the cage. And I think most of you know the story well. Before proper gas detection equipment, before proper ventilation in mines, uh, wouldn't the miners take uh, the, the, the bird in the cage down to the mine? And apparently, the way I understand the story is, is that the canary either stopped singing or had to die. And the, when the miner saw that, he knew he had a few extra minutes to get out of the mine because of the noxious gases. Well, my question for you is, would we call that a, a lagging indicator of a problem or a leading indicator? The difference being a lagging indicator tells us there's a problem after it occurs. A leading indicator warns us of the problem before it occurs. Lagging indicator or indi leading indicator when the miner goes down into the mine? I guess that the answer here is, it depends on whose viewpoint. If you're the miner, it's a leading indicator to go into uh, the mine carrying the canary. But if you're the bird, it's a very bad lagging indicator. <laughs> you have to die before someone says, oh yes, there's a problem here. I, I show this example just to show many times we put our hearing testing, our audiometric testing in the place of the bird. We use our audiometric testing to define whether there's a problem or not. And generally people have to lose hearing before somebody says, oh, there's a problem here. Uh, we can lose our hearing. Well, we already did lose our hearing. When, when we use our hearing testing as, a, uh, as, the, as the indicator. We now have a few solutions that we'll talk today just a bit about fit testing and in-ear exposure monitoring, as two solutions that uh, are very much leading indicators. They're, they warn us immediately if there's a problem before we go uh, down into the mine in terms of noise exposure. Uh, let's talk first about the earplug fit testing. For a number of years, we've had respiratory fit testing, and now we have several manufacturers that have earplug fit testing systems available um, that can uh, measure that fit. Uh, I have one here today, and, and I'd be happy to run through demonstrations if any of you would want to actually check the fit of your earplugs. We have some earplugs in the sample bag there, and, and you can see exactly how much protection you're getting if you would like to uh, try that yourself. So it provides an accurate real-world picture of exactly how much protection you're getting. It helps in selecting the right hearing protector because what works the best hearing protector for you might not be the best, might not be the best protector for you or for you or for you. It uh, includes one-on-one -on -one training. It makes the published rating on the package obsolete. It's not relevant what number is on the package when you actually can measure how much protection each worker is getting. This, uh, Vera, this Vera, Pro, uh, Vera Pro stands for verification of the protection, Vera Pro, uh, has several different modes, a complete check mode, a quick check mode, it has some reports, but it also has uh, some training videos built in. If you have a worker who obtains some very low protection levels, you can immediately go into training mode and, and, sh and pull up the video for that particular earplug and show. Oh, with that earplug, you really must roll it down nice and small and make sure there's no creases, no wrinkles in that earplug. And then reach over that head, pull out that ear canal, just similar to the, the video that you saw just a few moments ago, to model for the worker what that good fit should look like. 
Uh, it can be used with an ear earplug from, from any manufacturer, but the report not only shows how much protection you're obtaining with, in that ear, but also shows what's the maximum noise level that you can work in when you're wearing the earplugs uh, just the way you have the, them fit now. For example, this can, worker can uh, uh, work in 105 decibels of noise and still be very safely protected. Uh, it also t indicates the noise level, estimated noise level at the eardrum. So if this worker is getting a certain level of protection, then 75 decibels is at the eardrum. We're actually measuring that now. We took this system out into the field and tested 100 workers. These were our results. Our instructions to the worker were this. Take whatever earplug you have in your pocket and insert it the way you normally insert that earplug. And these were the results. Uh, each dot is one of these 100 workers. They had quite a variety of earplugs, including some custom molded earplugs down here too. The red line indicates the rating number that was on the package. Um, and uh, you can see about one third of the workers obtained protection levels that were higher than the rating number on the package. About one third of the workers had protection levels just maybe five decibels below the rating number on the package. But look at this. About one third of the workers had protection levels all over the place, very low in some cases here. If you put this into a distribution, it looks like this. It's almost a bell curve with a tail on the end. And this tail, these are the workers who will be losing their hearing. They're putting in the earplugs every day, but it's a terrible fit. It's not a good fit. And so they're actually going to be losing their hearing or filing the claims for the hearing loss. We actually interviewed these workers who had a very good fit, the workers who obtained protection levels higher than the rating number on the package. We wanted to see, is there a common denominator? Is there a common factor in uh, predicting whether a worker gets a good fit? We thought maybe it was gender. Maybe women have smaller air canals and get a better fit, and that didn't, you know, did not matter at all. Age made no difference. How many years they had worked in noise made no difference. The ear canal size, how familiar they were with that earplug. Whether they had used that earplug for two weeks or two years, it made no difference. That was not a good predictor as to whether someone would get a good fit. Even the model of the earplug really made no difference. There was no one magic earplug that fit everybody really well. All right, it must have something to do with training, right? Well, no, it made no difference how many group training sessions they had been to. But if any worker could tell us that they had had personal training, some kind of one-on-one -on -one instruction, how to fit the earplugs, that was the golden ring, we say in English, right? That was the, the magic thing that, to determine whether some of them could, would get a good fit or not. If any worker could tell us, um, it, actually, let me back up. We had a number of workers say, oh, I've, I've been to the group training sessions, uh, been through doing that five times, 10 times. That made no difference at all. But if any worker could say, yes, the first week I came on my job, my safety manager showed me how I should put in the earplugs as part of my orientation. If any worker, worker, uh, worker said that, then chances were very high that they would be in our good group, a uh, good fit. Uh, by the way, also uh, we tried to fitting just a second pair of earplugs on a number of workers. We wanted to see if someone has a bad fit with earplug A, will they have a bad fit with earplug B or earplug C? And actually, it, there were some big differences just on determining which earplug you're using. Here's a number of workers who had a 10, 15, even a 20 decibel difference between their first earplug and the second earplug they tried. And uh, we gave them no additional instruction. Just by trying a different earplug many times, they had much better fit. So this answers the question, is there a right earplug for you? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, now, some workers did not have much change at all, but many of the workers had quite a big difference just by trying a different style of earplug. So uh, as an audiologist, I really like these types of systems, these fit testing systems that actually measure, we're not estimating, we're actually measuring how much protection we get from the earplugs now. Uh, it makes these rating numbers on the box fairly obsolete. We don't have to look at the SNR and, and guess as to how much protection we're getting. We can actually measure it. Uh, great for uh, regulatory compliance. We don't have to do any D ratings. Uh, I like this one a lot now. We can now determine some work relatedness. If someone has a hearing loss, but we can show that they are protected on the job all the time, then that helps, uh, helps us prepare, helps us defend if, uh, if a compensation claim is, is filed for that, that uh, work-relatedness. Now, 
the the investment here is there's certainly a cost to these kinds of systems several several thousand dollars us for many of these systems also quite some time invested it takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes to run through two or three fit tests on a worker and so uh, do you have that kind of time for e all of your workers to uh, run through a fit test and it's not standardized in the sense we don't see anything about fit testing in eu regulations just because it's fairly new technology let's speak for just a moment about this in-ear exposure monitoring the concept here is that I think you're very familiar. We have noise uh, dosimeters or noise dose meters that can be put onto the belt or pocket of a worker. Uh, it comes up to a microphone somewhere near the collar, and we will leave that on the worker for several hours, maybe the entire work shift. And even though that worker is in and out of noise throughout the day, this uh, exposure meter or dose meter actually will measure and average that exposure throughout the day. At the end of the day, you see what was the average exposure, even though that worker was in and, in and out of noise throughout the day. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take that dosimeter and actually just shrink it down and just put it inside that worker's ear? And we wouldn't do it on just one side, we'd actually do it on both sides. And then we put the earplugs over that, that dosimeter. And that's exactly what has been done here with this concept of in-ear dosimetry or in-ear exposure monitoring. Uh, we can actually measure the noise dose under the hearing protectors now, just like the EU directive has, has challenged us to do for a number of years. Provides real-time monitoring, and it really is the only indicator as to whether someone will be suffering a noise-induced hearing loss. It also has the advantage of showing not only a good fit. At the end of the day, you can, you can see whether the worker has had a good fit with his hearing protection. It tells if you've had a bad fit, but also if the worker cheats. Remember the slide about our cheating time? If the worker cheats, and here we have a worker who's, who's putting his earplugs, he's pulled them out, just has them around his neck like this. The uh, meter inside is reading very high because it's just the ambient noise that he's measuring now. Uh, the, the microphones are here and here, uh, inside, uh, you know, at, um, essentially at the ear tip that he has around his neck. And so you're actually now uh, uh, getting some indication of how much this worker is cheating on this hearing protection. Uh, there are indicators inside these devices that, in, that warn you if you're reaching your 95% no noise dose or going over limit. We'll hear about that in just a few minutes. If you were to plot this every day, this is what the exposure looks like uh, each day. So this graph covers about 30 months, let's say two and a half years here. And uh, how much dose or noise exposure this worker has each day? You can see that the first few days the worker wears this, he's getting overdose. He's getting over that 85 decibel limit. In fact, each day he's seeing how much noise dose he has and uh, actually maybe fitting his hearing protection better. Or maybe he is uh, not pulling, taking them out. He's not cheating so often on his wear time. Uh, and after the first few days, then his noise dose comes down quite a bit until for the last two years, he has no noise exposure over 85 decibels, not even close. Now, nothing changed in the job of this worker. Nothing changed in his noise exposure. The only thing that changed was how well he fit his hearing protection, how consistently he wore that hearing protection. Again, as an audiologist, I like these kinds of solutions, this fit testing or this dosimetry, exposure monitoring inside the ear, under the hearing protection. And the reason I like it is if we rely upon audiometric testing, the hearing testing, to warn us if there's a problem, we can sometimes go uh, one year, two years, three years, four years before we raise the flag and say, oh yes, this worker is losing his hearing from the loud noise. And we, when we identify that, does that solve the problem? Well, not necessarily. Many times it just restarts the clock. And we go back and start testing him again, one year, two years, three years, four years. And many years can pass before we can raise the flag and say, oh, this, this canary stopped singing. <coughs> this worker is starting to lose some hearing. Um, and in some cases, the workers lose quite a bit of hearing before someone warns them that there's a problem here. I like these kind of fit test systems or the in-ear exposure monitoring because you know on day one, the very first day, you can do a fit test and, and before the worker even goes out into the facility, you know whether he has a proper fit or not. So you don't have to wait years and years for that, that answer. Again, I love also the, the idea that this, this was the first slide that we saw, remember, that when we have a noise-induced hearing loss, uh, it's the combination of the off-job noise exposures and the on-the-job noise exposures. If someone is losing their hearing, we don't have a good way of 
differentiating or, or knowing how much was from off the job or on the job. Well, now when we have this kind of data, this kind of documentation that says, well, this worker was never exposed on the job over 85 decibels at his eardrum, then suddenly we've just removed on the job from from the uh, no, the the hearing loss. You know, what do you do off the job? Oh, you you play in that band every weekend, or you do some kind of noisy hobby. We'll talk here in just a few minutes. We'll turn some time. I think Marit will, will discuss the intelligent hearing protection. This is a device that has that like, personal exposure monitoring built into it, including some other uh, uh, good features. This fit testing or fit check is, occurs as soon as you insert this device. It has active noise reduction, impulse noise protection uh, from uh, impact noise. Speech enhancement is built into this also. It plugs into the communication radio and it has the personal exposure monitoring such that if you are exceeding or coming close to your noise limit of 95% of that, then a warning signal goes off and it alerts you that you're close to that noise exposure limit. For the oil and gas industry, for lots of industries that have high noise, this is critical because I don't know if any of you are in this situation where you, because of the exposure limits, you can put workers into that noise situation for a very limited amount of time. In many cases, uh, a worker can only be in that noise maybe for one hour or two hours. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually measure and leave that worker in there for a longer time period knowing that he was safely protected? That's the purpose of some of these systems like the fit testing and the in-ear exposure monitoring. I have the pleasure now of turning some time over. You don't get to hear from Brad Pitt, uh, Brad Witt, uh, but uh, to turn some time over to my apologies for the funny pronunciation of the names, but here for Roar Oidal uh, from uh, uh, Bergenberg, who has uh, a case study to present, and they have uh, actually measured the fit on several of their workers and has some good information that I found very, very helpful to review. Uh, th then we'll turn some time over to Mart Opsanger from uh, L O B uh, L B O. <laughs> I can't say this is Linjebig, Linjebig, uh, offshore. Uh, I thank these two very much for joining us today and sharing their results. It's not an easy thing to stand in front of your colleagues and uh, freely share your results of what worked and what didn't work as far as your hearing conservation program. But I thank these two very much for uh, that sharing. Let's begin with Roar. So for you, those, uh, for you, those who don't know Bernberg, we are um, delivering services mainly offshore, uh, like scaffolding and, and isolation services, and also uh, painting. And a common factor of those services we deliver that were quite noise, uh, exposure to noise. Uh, not only background noise, but also the noise we produce ourselves by using the equipment that we use, like needle picking and high pressure equipment. Uh, so uh, that's why we heavily rely on having um, uh, what you might call um, oh, a barrier, and we have a noise program to protect our workers. And we heavily rely on, on the factors that we have time restrictions and that the protective uh, equipment we use are good enough. So that's what we wanted to test. So we used Veripool as a system. Uh, and I guess you all, know, uh, you all know, and Brad told you, there are, that there are two problems using earplugs as a barrier. First of all, there is the fit problem. You have to know that, that it fits. And if you look, if you know each other a little bit better, I would ask you to turn around and look at your partner's ear. And then turn around again and look at the other partner sitting beside you. And, we'll, and you might see the difference. Because the air canal is so... Uh, varies so much. It can be quite huge, it can be small, it can be narrow, it can be wide, it can, it can be crooked, it can be quite straight. So believing that one airplug fits all is like believing everybody would fit my shoe. And that's, you know, we all know that for a fact that that wouldn't go well. And of course, there is the second problem that do we use it right? So that's what we wanted to test. Uh, there are other means or measure to, 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 to see the intonation levels, uh, but we use very poor uh, because of this system doesn't rely on one type of airplugs or that the airplug must be made by one manufacturer. So you can use different airplugs from different manufacturers, and that's an advantage. Um, 
It also uses a Loudness Balance Test. I'm not sure if you know what that means. It means that you take the subjective um, that the user must use his hearing, uh, and he must try to level the voice, uh, the the noise volume. So what we actually do in the test is like you put on hair, uh, earphones, and then you try to level the noise between right and left ear, and it can be quite tricky because there is a small difference in the pitch, but with a little bit of training it works quite well. And after you've done that, you level the noise, you take them off, and you put one earplug into the right ear, and then you repeat the exercise, try, trying to level the noise. Um, and then again, when you feel that the noise is level, you take them off again, and you can see I'm a flight attendant here, and then you put in in the left ear, and then you repeat it all again. And then after the end, you have uh, the intonation rating or uh, the exposure level. Uh, so what we did uh, offshore, uh, I also say we used something called a quick test. We tested uh, uh, on 500 hertz, and that's because that's a, a quite a uh, nice way to see if there are leakage. I don't know if you remember uh, Brad's um, plot diagram. You could easily see that from 500, you got better intonation, even though you had the leakage. So that's really a good starting point. So here, is the, here are the results of the first test we did. And, you, and you, as you can see here, we have a group of what we call low performers. We have 12 individual out of 40, and here you can see the intonation value, uh, how much protection the airplug actually gives. So these low performers had an average about nine decibels, which is quite low, in my opinion, and uh, the total intonation level with, within the group was about 22 decibel. So after, that, after we did the first test, we gave individual instructions and tried to find the best fitted airplug for each individual. And I'll show you the next result. You can see a, a dramatic, dramatic improvement in the result. We only have two workers left with poor, what I would call, low performers. The problem with these two, that they had the biggest air canals I've ever seen. They were like huge, massive. So you could probably put like two of these into their air. So that's quite challenging. But as you can see, we managed to lift 10 out of these workers up here to get a better protection level, which we are quite happy about. And of course, these two workers uh, have to go onshore and get air, uh, molded airplugs because we couldn't find any way to protect them with, with the airplugs we had. Uh, and I forgot to mention that the airplug we tested was like a standard. Uh, airplugs offshore. We had tested between diff three different types, but I also had with me like eight or nine different other plugs that I used if I couldn't find the right intonation level within the three. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. In the red line on 16 decibels, is there a reason why it's on 16? Yeah, it's, it's like. Um, uh, we tested at five medium um, 500 hertz, uh, and um, if you look at um, some of, uh, I think it's uh, Noskolje gas, the guidelines. Um, when you come to medium uh, hertz level, uh, you get a better intonation. So that's why we put it here. Yeah, we had to put it somewhere. Yeah. I think like 16 decibel was a good point to put it. Uh, and also interesting point, uh, we also tested uh, pre-molded airplugs. Uh, and the result, we, we I tested five people with pre-molded, and two of them had intonation readings below five decibel. And for me, that's a warning sign. It also indicates that pre-molded airplugs may provide a false sense of security. I know it's, I know it's the. Uh, the, uh, the number of tests we did, five, isn't that much. But I also interviewed each of the workers, each of the 40 workers, and 20 of them had used pre-molded airplugs before. Uh, Custom molded, yeah. Uh, and they all told me, well, most of them told me they didn't use it anymore because they didn't feel it, you know, 
it fit right or they didn't feel it give, gave enough protection. So that's, for me, that's a warning sign. But of course, I have to be careful, you know, uh, drawing any conclusions. But at least it's an indicator. <coughs> so here you see uh, all the tests we did. I think we did about 110 tests. And the point of this uh, plot is to show you that you need a certain minimum of air plugs to protect your workers. I mark these ones, like four, number 4, 9, 13, 21, 31, and so on. They only got protected by one air plug. And if you look at all the, the entire group, with three different air plugs, we managed to, to protect nine out of 10 workers with readings over 16 decibels. And that's quite good. And here you see we used other types, like we had 5% among the nine different air plugs I used. And we have those two that we didn't manage to get good readings from. And I just want to tell you, I think it's a nice story about number 21. He was a male, he was like 50 years old, and he was so passionate in, into music. You know, music was his life. And he was so concerned about his hearing. And <laughs> I think this was his first result. And he said, I never get this right. And he tried so many times, and he had really looked for airplugs that fitted him, but he couldn't. So he and I sat for like one hour and 15 minutes to find the right airplug. Uh, and I didn't test them all, because we, we sat over and over again, and, and I didn't use, want to use very pro each time, because that was kind of tiring. So finally, oh, now I feel how it's supposed to be. And then we tested it again, and look at this one. He managed to get 35 intonation, and that was massive, a massive improvement. And he was so happy, you know, because now he was like confident that he was protected by dangerous noise or noise. So he went out with a smile. And I think one of my conclusions of this study is that um, the workers had a very good experience because within this, uh, giving them personal instructions and telling them how much important it is to use it, actually use it correct and finding the right plugs gives them confidence that they are protected. So that's, that's um, one of the main advantages, in my opinion, is that you're actually able to sit down and do this exercise. Um, how much time do you got left? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you should have said that like five minutes ago. <laughs> so I also want to show you, um, uh, we had a, with this study, a, a questionnaire at Bernberg. Uh, because after we did this study using Veripro, uh, we had a, a campaign related to noise, like in March, April this year. Uh, and we emphasized, well, we had a number of things we emphasized in, in this campaign, but one of them was how to use and find correct airplugs. And uh, of course, we also had emphasized on our own uh, noise regime, which uh, consists of two things. It's like t time limits, and of course, using the right uh, protection like single or, single or double hearing aid. Um, and I know you said that uh, if you have group training, you wouldn't get as much effect. But our study or our uh, shows that, yeah, it, at least it indicates it has some effect. But then again, in, in our campaign, we emphasized you know, the importance of using the right airplugs and how to use it and finding your airplugs. And we also, instead of testing each individual, we taught them this exercise. If you have the airplugs in and you're in a noise environment, you can actually see if the airplugs work. If you cup your hands over your ears like this, and you hear, if you hear no changes in the volume, you can assume that you're safely protected. So uh, what we did, we asked the workers, have you received any no uh, information about noise prevention, how to protect yourself? You know, have you attended the campaign? And control and saw that against the question, have you access to air plugs that you feel suits your air? And as you can see here, eight out of 10 workers who, who attended the campaign said, yeah, I find air plugs that suits my air. Uh, but uh, if you didn't attend that campaign, only six out of 10 said, yeah, I can find air plugs that fit my air. So, and 
um, they all had the same, you know, uh, access to the same airplugs. And this is uh, like 647 people answering, you know, this questionnaire. So, and here is the morale, why I show this. Because even though you can't start tomorrow by having an individu individual approach, at least you can start with a few things. You can start getting a proper selection of airplugs. And uh, my recommendation is that you have one small, two medium size, where one is soft and one is like medium hard, and then you have a big one. Uh, and then you give, provide training, and not at least you underline the importance of using them correctly. Uh, this study that we did um, using Veripro is also a part of Nosco Ligas program for, for noise. Um, and I just, Frank is sitting there, so I want to thank him for helping me uh, making this study. So thank you, Frank. I guess that was my, yeah. I hope you liked it. My name is Marit Opsanger, and Oh, whoops. I'm working for Lenny Big Offshore. And I'd like to share with you our uh, ex. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, our experience uh, to protect our workers from uh, uh, exposure or high noise level. And, um, and to reduce the risk of. Uh, uh, obtaining permanent hearing loss. Doesn't work. There, it works. Our motivation for testing new equipment was, um, first of all, we have workers who work in very high noise levels and unacceptable high noise levels. Um, and um, we're doing scaffoldings, okay. scaffoldings, uh, cutting, performing cu uh, steel cuttings and weldings, uh, rigging and various jobs with uh, rope access technique. Uh, due to limitation regarding maximum daily noise level doses uh, efficient I can just leave it here efficiency in executing the job job may be very difficult to maintain uh, to find a silent work um, alternative after maybe uh, very early in the morning when you have been exposed for too much noise, it's hard to find a silent work. Uh, and um, we have seen an increase in reporting hearing loss among our employees, as many other companies have seen. Uh, we first heard about Honeywell and the Quiet Hole last year. And in December, we tested the system together with Brunvall in Malte. We uh, got help from Honeywell, uh, Torger and Kersti. They helped us um, to measure the sound level. And as you can see, oh, whoops, here, we, the noise level reached 124.3 decibel in sand blasting activities. Uh, so for us, it was very interesting uh, to test this. Um, uh, this is the Quiet Pro system. It measures in the air the decibel you uh, are exposed for in the inner air that's the, and the in environment. So the result was that after the test, the inner air was exposed for only up to 75 decibel while sandblasting activities. And 
the purple graph here shows the uh, environment or the sound in the area around. So what was very interesting was that after only two minutes, if they didn't use, hadn't used this um, protection, they would have been, yeah, used the whole day doses. But he, uh, our workers tried this for 20 minutes and they only used less than 30% of the day do daily dose. Uh, because of the good results from these tests, uh, Lenebeck acquired two sets of Quiet Pro in May and we made a small test uh, on Draugen. Uh, first of all, we had some uh, uh, personal instruction given from Honeywell uh, prior to the actual test offshore, but um, the result was both positive and negative <laughs> feedback. Uh, they thought it was a little bit hassle with all the wires because even though it was hidden inside the overalls, they felt like um, like it was caught up in the surroundings and it was unusual to wear all the wirings together with all the other equipment we use because of the rope access technique we normally perform. Then we had a test on Heidrun. We have an employee who has a hearing loss, a permanent hearing loss. And he was asked to try this uh, system and he was very excited and very motivated because he had a, doct a doctor's certificate that says if we can't help him uh, uh, to get in si or have work with silent environment or low exposure of sound, he had to quit working for Lennebyg or be retrained. Uh, yeah. and he has conducted two tests uh, in 14 days. Uh, and uh, it, the feedback is very positive. He uh, felt it worked very good. He used it all day during the working period, except for lunch breaks and other breaks he had during the day. And I just have to look what he said. And he also um, managed to try them together with the radio communication equipment. And he said it was both in a silent environment and high noise environment and he said that in the low noise environment it was more or less like talking in normal radio equipment but in high uh, noise level he thought it was normally you raise your voice to speak together with your colleagues but he could speak normal because it was no need to raise his voice so that was a little bit interesting for him to recognize. Mm -hmm. And he was also uh, surprised how good the absorption of sound was when he was using these uh, protections. Um. And he had good help from the medic on board who also had been in a, a pilot project together on a pilot project on another platform so uh, the medic known about this uh, equipment and this device and what they could how good they could be and how to use them um, after the test this is the first day, yeah. We can see he has been exposed for helicopters and building scaffoldings. Uh, so, but we were a little bit surprised of the difference of the 
measuring on the outer ear, outer ear uh, because one is very high here. <laughs> and we think that might be because of his uh, place in the, in the helicopter, because it can be different from where you're sitting in the helicopter. If you have the window on your side or, yeah. But we are investigating that one, so we are not sure yet why it shows this high exposure. But in the inner ear, we can see he was only exposed for less than 15% of the daily dose. The second day, he was scaffolding, building scaffoldings the whole day. And after 11 hours, we can see he only nearly reached 40% of the daily dose. So it's very interesting to see how good the protection has been for him. Uh, based on all this positive experience we have had, we have decided to keep on using these equipments. And now, next um, next week, I think, we will start using them on uh, Elfisk. There are one platform there with four tur turbines that makes terrible noise, uh, extremely noisy area and we are going to have a project going on for a year. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see how our employees will be motivated and maybe work more than two hours a day. <laughs> so we hope that our effort to reduce the risk of permanent hearing loss injury will be fruitful for the, yeah, and we will get a lot of workers who will be satisfied for a long time. Thank you. All right, I'll show, share some information from a case study. This is a flooring manufacturer in the United States. They had a problem about 150 workers at the facility, high noise levels, 105 to 112 decibels. Because of that, they required 30 decibels from the earplugs that they use. Now in the US rating system, that means automatically it's a large foam earplug. And that's a problem because there were lots of females at this work site also. So if you require a large foam earplug, then many of the workers just will not get a good fit uh, with that. Also in many areas, they've required double protection, dual protection, simultaneous earplugs plus ear muffs. Oh, the workers did not like that. This was a part of the US that has high heat and humidity and the workers did not like to wear the ear muffs for eight or 10 hours a day. So the challenges here are to reduce the noise through engineering controls, how to deal with this diverse workforce of many females in the workforce there as far as the fit of the earplugs, ensure the workers are wearing the hearing protection properly. They first came through and did engineering controls and they actually invited the workers to give suggestions. One worker came back and said, yes, the machine I work on, all the noise is right at this, this source here. If I can design a, a cabinet to go over that with a door that closes off the noise, it will make it much quieter. And indeed, that's what they did. And it was very successful. It brought the noise levels down seven, eight, nine decibels. I think you can see the equipment here has many of these doors that have been placed over in order to uh, reduce the noise levels at the source. But it wasn't enough to bring the noise levels all the way down to safe levels. So they then tried the fit testing. And they brought in each of these 150 workers, one by one, in order to check the fit of the earplugs find the appropriate earplug, ensure the proper fit. In fact, the workers were certified to a particular earplug. In other words, if once they found out, uh, just like uh, Roar was uh, telling us, uh, you might try two or three different earplugs and then you find the right one for this worker, that worker received a sticker on their uh, identification badge that showed which earplug was the appropriate one for that worker. Also, workers could graduate out of double protection. By that I mean if a worker could show that he could get good protection just from an ear plug, then he no longer had to wear the ear muffs over the ear plug. He could get by, again, he had a, just a sticker that showed that he, he was good just with the ear plugs only. The workers liked this a lot because uh, it was a good motivation for them to get a good fit with the ear plugs. I liked this quote from these, this uh, personnel manager. He says, when an employee walks away, he knows 
how a good fit feels and sounds. And I think we heard that from Rora's comments here also. Uh, the worker walks in the door not knowing exactly what a good fit feels like, but then the, the, the light goes on. Uh, we call that the aha moment uh, when they say, oh, now I know what a good fit feels like. And I see the numbers now that uh, show that to me. These were their results. Actually, let me show this, these results. The dark blue bars here show the noise levels at the eardrum when they walk in the door. When they're with their first earplug, they fit the earplug the way they normally fit it. They obtain these results in the dark blue lines. Noise levels at the eardrum of, for many workers, 90, 95, 100 decibels under the hearing protector. Then with just a little bit of either training or maybe switching to a different earplug, now they have the light blue bars here. Noise levels at the eardrum, 80 and 85 decibels. They're very well protected. Two thirds of the workers changed earplug model. They thought they, they knew which earplug they liked to have, but as a result of the fit test, they changed to a different earplug that gave them better protection. I liked these results. Uh, for several years, this facility had, uh, in the U.S. system, we measure uh, check hearing every single year, and we always compare the current year back to the original hearing test to see if there's been any change. I believe you have something maybe similar in, in Norway. Uh, for ever, several years, they had about four or five employees every year who had a decline in hearing. And then when they instituted these noise controls and the uh, fit testing, the, the number of workers with a, a, a shift, a change in their hearing, dropped to the floor until they eventually had zero employees with a change in hearing from year to year. They stopped hearing loss. Uh, very successful. The second exam example that I have uh, fits more to the question that we were discussing here about is there a minimum level that everybody can rise to? And that was the goal of this company. This is an aerospace manufacturer. Let me set the scene just real quickly. Uh, this is a company that manufactures uh, uh, business jets uh, and we're in a hangar that's quite large. In fact, you can fit maybe 40 jets inside this hangar all under one roof. Several hundred employees are working in this facility at any one time. And so if a worker starts riveting over here, the worker over on this side can hear it just fine. In fact, that is much of the work they're, they're doing is the riveting process. The noise levels are not that loud in the facility, maybe 87 to 90 decibels average noise levels, but the peak noise levels are quite high, over 100 decibels when someone starts riveting. And when they do this riveting process, they're inside the fuselage. So someone is standing inside here, or sitting inside here, riveting, and it just resonates inside. It's quite, quite noisy. So they required 100% wear time. If you are on the, the shop floor, you must wear that hearing protection 100% of the time, whether you're riveting or not. So there's a high number of shifts in hearing, workers whose hearing is declining from year to year, high intermittent noise exposures in these enclosed spaces, but the overall noise level is just not that bad, maybe in the high 80s. Maybe it's too much protection. There is such a thing as overprotection. These, uh, this company tried engineering controls. It was very difficult to work out any engineering controls that were successful. So once again, they moved immediately to the, the fit testing. They defined 15 decibels. I think uh, Bernberg just described uh, uh, 16 decibels as a minimum level that you would like to achieve. They wanted every worker to get at least 15 decibels of protection. If someone did not get 15 decibels of protection, then you could either do fit training with the same earplug uh, or let's just switch to a different earplug and see how you do with that. These were their results. So these were about 1,500 workers that came in and on the very first test, about half of them, 55%, passed. They, got, they, they achieved 15 decibels of protection or more. Those that did not pass in the light blue bars here moved on to a second test. And again, about half of those workers passed on the second test. Those that did not pass moved on to a third test or a fourth test, or even a fifth test. Now, admittedly, as Roar mentioned here, you can often spend uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, maybe 30, 40 minutes here after, if you've lined up four or five different earplugs. So there is an investment of time to do that kind of testing. They eventually end up with a few employees who never get 15 decibels of protection. They, they've tried three, four, or five different earplugs. They fit them several different ways. And the interesting thing here is that most of these workers already knew it. They knew that they are very poor at fitting earplugs. Most of them said, I've, I've never been able to fit earplugs very well, so I just always wear the earmuffs. They identified themselves uh, already. 
maybe they have just a different bend in the air canal or something. Maybe it's not, uh, maybe they cannot tolerate the, the fit inside the, the air canal very well. These were the results from the company. The light blue line shows the first test that these workers and how many workers uh, uh, had that, that, uh, that fit. So then uh, the x-axis here shows the amount of protection these workers are receiving. You can see that many of these workers who did not get a good fit, who did not pass the first test, had protection levels on average 10, 11. In fact, the average here might be close to that 12 number that we were discussing earlier here. Uh, the, the average level, at least the, the most of the workers. Uh, but after the one-on-one -on -one training or after switching to a dampening earplug, we have the dark blue line results. And now the average protection level is almost double, about 23, 23, 24 decibels of protection. So we moved this mountain of protection to a higher level just with that one-on-one -on -one, uh, training. I enjoyed some of the uh, uh, comments that some of these workers gave. Uh, we asked them to fill out the questionnaire and uh, three-fourths of them said that when they came in uh, before the test, three-fourths of them said, oh, I'm, I'm very good at fitting the earplugs. I'm an expert or uh, I'm good at fitting the earplugs before we did the fit test. After the fit test, we asked, are you better able to fit your earplugs? Can you do a better fit now? And 84%, oh, yes. Yes, I am. They, uh, maybe I'm not as good at fitting the earplugs as I thought I was. I love some of these comments. I'll put a little more effort and get them deeper, this employee says. I've learned I've been using my earplugs wrong my whole career, this worker says. I'm amazed at the difference with the proper fit. I just learned how to effectively roll a plug before inserting it, like our little demonstration here. I found the best ear protection to fit my ears I've ever had in 15 years of aviation in working in this industry. So I think these kind of comments mirror what you've, you've heard already. Uh, also, this company shared with us their results of the uh, hearing loss. And again, for uh, several years, they had about 10 to 15 employees every single year whose hearing is getting worse, that canary is dying in the mine. Uh, but then when they institute this, these kinds of controls and this everyone has to get at least 15 decibels of protection, you have to prove it through your fit test, then the, amount, the number of employees who have a hearing loss, only about one, in fact the average here is one employee each year uh, out of these 1,500 employees. Well, a number of case studies that we can go through, uh, but let me pause here, see if there's any questions about the material that you've heard today or any comments of what works well at your facilities, what does not work well. Anything to add? All right. Well, my sincere thanks to you. We're about to, to the close of our time. I thank you very much for giving up some time to spend, uh, spend some time with us today to talk about uh, the hearing protection. I think the, the moral of the story here is that uh, hearing loss due to loud noise, it's, uh, it's permanent hearing loss. There's no pill, there's no surgery, there's no rehabilitation that brings it back. It's a painless hearing loss. Workers often don't even know that they're suffering that hearing loss. Uh, it's a painless injury. It's a very progressive loss. It, it gets worse year after year, but also the message that we hope we can give today is it's very preventable to stop that noise-induced hearing loss and number of tools that can uh, be uh, used today to do that. We've uh, provided a, a bag here that has a few. I didn't take a good look inside. A few earplugs inside. Oh, great. Good here. And if anybody would like uh, for the demonstration, if you're doing some training, feel free to pick up a funnel. I'll put the instruction page here. I'll stay up close here if there's any specific questions. We have demonstrations of some of these uh, solutions we've talked about as far as the, the uh, communication uh, uh, headset, the uh, uh, Quiet Pro. I can do a fit test on anybody if you'd like to see how well you fit your own earplugs. But my sincere thanks to Marat and Roar for, for uh, sharing your results with us today and thank you for your participation today.